So, Peter, I thank you so much for receiving us in your beautiful building, and um, you are very close to René Girard. And so, my first question will be, how did you meet René? Well, I met him uh, first as an undergraduate in the late 1980s. Uh, it's when I was uh, studying philosophy at Stanford, and it was, uh, it was one of uh, these ideas that was sort of starting to percolate uh, in the underground, that uh, there was this uh, very uh, interesting professor with these different, uh, diff different accounts from the world. Uh, it was very much, I, I think, uh, out of temper with, with the times, and so it, it had sort of a natural appeal to a somewhat rebellious undergraduate. Oh, yeah. You thought you were rebellious and undergraduate? Yeah. Well, it, I think, I think there, there was a, certainly a conformity of ideas that one, mm. one, one has uh, probably in most times and most places, and, uh, and there, there was certainly a sense in which it presented this, uh, this very different uh, yeah. critique, both of uh, the modern world, of Christianity, of, of thinking about a number of different topics. So what would be your first impression, in a way, that would be that he's, um, he has a view of the world? What would be your first impression of when he... Well, the first impression of the view was that it's crazy, and this, uh, <laughs> it can't be true that uh, imitation is this important, drives uh, this many different things. And uh, I, I found that it was, it was uh, one of these ideas that uh, took a while to sink in. And, uh, but uh, as, I, as I thought about it more over a period of several years, it, it struck me as, uh, as being incredibly powerful, describing both uh, things that I thought were true of my own experience, as well as uh, making sense of a lot of uh, uh, aspects of the world outside of that. Yeah, it's like René Girard is a very controversial person, but at the same time he's a genius. And, uh, yes. And it, it took so many years, you know, for people to understand what you just said, that he's a main person, you know, to, in the world of philosophy and the way to see the world. Yes, so well, I, yeah. I, suspect, uh, I suspect that uh, when the history of the 20th century is written circa 2100, he will, he'll be seen as truly one of the great uh, intellectuals. But it may still be a long time till it's, uh, till it's fully, fully understood. If you'd have a lunch discussion or a discussion with him in the, um, in, in, uh, at some of the coll uh, colloquium seminars that we did at Stanford, where uh, one would really be struck just by his incredible uh, perceptiveness into human nature. So it was, it was not... It was, it, was, it, it, was, it was always these, uh, these very particular moments where uh, this is what was going on, this is what really was happening in this context. And, uh, and there was a, just a, an unbelievable uh, perceptiveness. And of course, sort of a breadth of interest, too, where you know, I, think, I think Girard is uh, one, of the, one of the last great uh, generalists who's really interested in everything. Yeah. And, uh for me, it's like each time I see René, it's like I feel younger, I feel fresh and with new ideas to, to see the world and to go further in the world. Do you have the same Yes, perception? yes, exactly. I think it's, 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 uh, it's always that there are, there are elements of it where uh, you, you see, this, yeah, you see this, this completely new perspective on, on life that, that you would not have otherwise, otherwise thought about. And you are such a successful uh, businessman, chess master, etc. Can you recall from the European public what are your main um, steps in, in your life? And uh, Well, I did, I did a number of things. I studied philosophy as an undergraduate at Stanford, yeah. went to law school, and then uh, sort of veered on a professional uh, law and finance career in New York. And, um, and then I uh, moved back to California in the uh, late 1990s and got involved in the technology boom of the time. I was the co-founder, CEO of a company called uh, PayPal, which was a successful online payments company. And then from 2002 onwards, I ended up uh, working as a, more as an investor, um, working with a variety of tech companies, uh, notably Facebook, where I was the original investor, as well as, uh, as, well as um, uh, managing money, trying to figure out the future of the world, and still at the same time trying to pursue uh, some, um, some intellectual nonprofit pursuits and uh, trying to make sense of the future and try, trying to uh, leave the world a better place. Yeah. And so, but how mimetic theory has influenced your business in a way, your way to see the world and to, to, to do business? Well, I, way, yeah. I think it has influenced it very powerfully, although it's, uh, it's again, I, it's always sort of a very particular context. Uh, I'll give you two or three examples of how it has influenced me. I think 
One, one piece that's very important as both an entrepreneur and as an investor is uh, that there's a tremendous value in trying to do things that are um, new or that are different. And, uh, and so uh, thinking about how um, disturbingly herd-like people become in so many different contexts um, is something that mimetic theory forces you. It forces you to think about that, which is this uh, sort of knowledge that's generally um, suppressed and hidden. And, and so uh, you will be, um, as an investor entrepreneur, I've always tried to be contrarian, to go against the crowd, to identify opportunities that in places where people were not looking. And I think uh, that those are the places one finds the, the greatest opportunities, whether it's in starting companies or in making investments. On, on the level of, um, of managing a business, um, one of the ways in which it's influenced me a great deal is thinking about how to avoid conflict within a business and, uh, and how um, uh, so the standard account of conflict is that it arises when people fight about uh, uh, differences, whereas in mimetic theory, conflict arises when people fight about the same thing. Mm -hmm. And certainly my experience over the last uh, 10, uh, 12 years is that that's almost always the case, that uh, the really great conflicts were over uh, people wanting the same thing, the same position, the same promotion, the same set of responsibilities. And, uh, and so one of the challenges as a, um, as a CEO in a lot of these companies, I think, mm -hmm. is to try to apply mimetic theory and preemptively avoid conflict by making sure that roles are reasonably well differentiated. And in an early stage entrepreneurial setting, this is extremely difficult because the roles tend to be very fluid. And so there's sort of a tremendous um, mm -hmm. possibility for mimetic conflict and uh, there's tremendous value in avoiding it. And most of these companies, um, whether they succeed or fail, is often driven by internal dynamics, not by external ones. It is whether uh, the people are able to work together well enough to create a new product or build a new technology, rather than uh, the sort of external competitive landscape, which is the way uh, the conventional business um, world uh, describes, uh, describes companies. And um, what should be the ethic in business using mimetic theory? What would be the special ethic um, when you are so much involved in, and, uh, in the process of making a better world? Well, in, in business, it's, it's, I, I don't know if there's a simple formula that you can just say this is the yeah. formula. I, I do think that there's an incredible importance on avoiding certain types of conflict and that uh, there are ways in which uh, there are a lot of conflicts that spiral in very, very bad directions and, um, and I think uh, they are, they're counterproductive both in a business context, in a personal context, in a political context um, and I think that's, that's probably the, the piece that I find, that I find most, most compelling. Um, but then also probably understanding uh, what healthy relationships look like, where uh, you know you, you're mentoring somebody in a way that's constructive, where there's no rivalry, or um, and and figuring out a good way to sort of collaborate with people and trying to avoid um, sort of um, the bad aspects of mimesis while keeping the good. I mean, there's always obviously a very important question: yeah. how much theoretical knowledge translates yeah. into into practical knowledge? So you know, you could have um, you could have people who know that, um, in theory, um, eating lots of donuts is bad for you, but they still <laughs> eat donuts or something like yeah. that. So there are all sorts of ways in which it, it doesn't translate. Mm. But uh, I, I do, I do think there is there's some way that it it translates. It's it's very um, it's very uh, how should I put it? It's very imprecise how that happens. Uh, but I do think. Obviously, there's a general sense where uh, scapegoating mm. only works if you do not know who the scapegoat is. And so, as the mechanism gets better understood, I think it will become harder to do. Now, it may, it may simply manifest itself in other new ways which may be better or worse, but uh, I, I do think there's a hope that as these mechanisms are understood, it will stop happening um, as mechanisms of crazy rivalry are understood, it will happen less rather than more. Yeah, so it's a very positive thinking about life and future. But very good nowadays. Well, everybody is so negative, but it's good. Everything is going to be destroyed. 
that uh, understanding of mimetic design is going to be something that's going to help people. Yes, well, it's it's um, it's certainly um, well. I'm not uh, I'm not sort of always uh, sort of Panglossian optimistic. Mm -hmm. I I do think that um, sort of any hopeful future of the 21st century is one where um, there will be more good mimesis than bad mimesis. Mm -hmm. um, the forms of transcendence people uh, buy into will be healthy, not not fake. Um, and so I think I think uh, it is uh, it is it is very much linked to whether the world blows itself up in this next century, whether we learn to uh, figure out ways to live with one another.